Good to go. There we go. Good evening. Well, welcome to Capgemini's Applied Innovation Exchange. My name is Joe Bojo. Uh, happy to, to host you this evening. I see a lot of familiar faces, so for those of you that have been here multiple times now, welcome back. Uh, for those of you that this is your first time to a What's Now, let me just give you a little bit of history and a little bit of context of how we got started on this, this journey and a little bit about where you're at. Uh, so we opened this facility in 2015, uh, and it was about that time that we got connected with uh, a gentleman you'll meet shortly, Pete Layden, and we started thinking about, you know, Capgemini is a, a, a big global company based in Paris, but we were looking to expand and reintroduce ourselves in many ways in, in this local community here, and we came up with the concept of how do we give more than we get? We've got a great facility here, and we want to get to know the community, and we really want to connect with a lot of the thought leaders and, and uh, you know, the key constituents in this area. So what if we came up with a, a speaker series where we brought in some, some really amazing people and opened our doors and brought in the community and on a regular basis? And I, I've lost track of how many of these we've done you know, between here and we also do what's now New York. So I think we're, we're up over 40, 45 range. So and we've covered a, a whole bunch of different topics. So uh, thank you for coming in. You, you, you play an active role in the concept of exchanging. So. Uh, we look forward to getting to know you and exchanging with, with Tristan later this evening uh, and, and with each other after the fact. Uh, just a little bit of context of what we do here. So Applied Innovation Exchange. So exchange meaning we host our largest clients from around the world who have substantial transformation challenges and we exchange with them as well as the, uh, the various constituencies here in the, the Bay Area. We have 16 facilities like this around the world and uh, you know, so if anyone has questions about that after the fact, we're happy to, to walk you through and share in more detail what we do. I also want to introduce you to another Capgemini executive, uh, a, a friend and colleague, Jean-Claude Violet. So Jean-Claude is a, a key leader here. He's been with Capgemini uh, quite a while, and he's one of the first senior leaders uh, to, to bring Capgemini into this region. So I want him to give you a little bit of context of, uh, of who we are, what we do. Thank you, Joe. Hi. Hi, everybody. Bonjour. Bonsoir. So, oui, ça va très bien. <laughs> um, I landed in this uh, fantastic region 20 years ago uh, from uh, Grenoble, French Alps, uh, where actually Capgemini was founded in 1967. Um, now we have 220,000 employees across the globe, and we are heavily investing here in, uh, in California. Actually, uh, Risto, who's here, uh, is the founder of a, a great company called Idean. Uh, based in Palo Alto, and uh, we're now a global global team, right? So, so we are investing massively, and uh, we have only one objective in mind: is uh, you know, you know, to really uh, brainstorm about the next big ideas for our clients. And we are addressing uh, big topics. And tonight, it's definitely a big topic. Uh, I'm a father of uh, four kids, so I can tell you that uh, the ethical use of technology is a, probably a day-to-day -day topic at home. Um, also as a consumer, of course, and also as a professional in you know, working for Capgemini uh, with our clients. So um, uh, very happy that uh, you are here. This is, uh, this is an environment where uh, we, uh, we, again, we create big ideas almost every day. And uh, this is thanks to you and thanks to uh, uh, you know, our, our partner ecosystem in, in the Valley in San Francisco that we can do that. With that, I would like to uh, introduce you to Peter, uh, who is going to introduce the, our speakers. Thank you, John claude Thanks, uh, thanks, Capgemini. And for those who have been coming here consistently, it's been four years. Joe is right. It's been 45 of these gatherings. And it's always been trying to get leading thinkers in different technologies to come in and th talk about what's going now what's the issues they're grappling with now and what they're looking at in the future. And in general, we usually have a, some technologist in here, someone, an entrepreneur, someone who's basically wrestling with a different kind of technology. It's generally been a can-do, kind of positive way we frame what we're talking about here. But I must say, in the last couple of years, we've watched with the tech lash kind of coming through the society, uh, we've also been tuned into kind of being you know, self-critical and starting to really look hard at the tech world. We've had a lot of kind of interesting um, gatherings here. I don't know if some of you might have been here for Julie Hanna, who is really kind of thinking through what's happening for women and the, and the role of women, the, what women have been through in technology. It's a very moving and very interesting uh, th uh, event. Uh, we've done a bunch of them here. We also in New York, actually next week, I'm doing one with Scott Galloway, and Scott is going to go off 
on the kind of goring the the the, uh, the tech unicorns, uh, how he thinks it's way overvalued, and he's going to be drawing an analogy to what he thinks is going on now in the stock market, making the analogy to 20 years ago, the great dot com crash. Uh, I don't know if I go as far as Scott. We'll explain. We'll talk about that next time. But um, but what we are, what we definitely have is a sense of technology. Um, is redeemable. Uh, technology isn't a bad thing. There's a lot of good folks. There's a lot of positive things about technology. And that we like to, t we really think of technology as the, the insiders are really struggling to do the right thing. There's a lot of people with really good will who really want to actually respond right, want to evolve technology, want to tune into the kind of unintended consequences, do things about that. And that's really what we're going to talk about today uh, with Tristan Harris. Uh, Tristan is, uh, is really fits that mold. He's an insider who totally gets the tech world. He was uh, kind of, in the early days, was, was working at the Stanford per Persuasive Technology Lab, kind of understanding how that works. He actually was the CEO of his own company. I think it was called Alt Altour, is that what it was? Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry. And uh, it was bought by Google. So he's kind of run a company, got bought by Google. Inside Google, he was the design ethicist. Um, and he, inside there, he started raising concerns about uh, watching how this attention-grabbing business models, all the kind of unintended consequences and the, and the downside of what that, that model is doing. And he actually built a presentation internally that got circulated within Google among many, many other employees that got a lot of attention about what one might be going wrong here, what we could do differently. Uh, and that eventually went outside. Uh, he started bringing that message outside. He's done TED Talks. He's been on 60 Minutes. He's been interviewed all over the place. Um, and so about uh, in 2018, he co-founded with a couple of the founders I think are here, a thing called the Center for Humane Tech. Uh, and they started really the last bit, their first rev has been really working on what's really going wrong? What is the problem? How do we explain it to more people? How do people get understand what's happening? But recently they've been working on solutions. How do we start fixing this? What's the kind of design principles we could use going forward? And we're very fortunate tonight that for the first time publicly, Tristan is going to basically lay out uh, some of these ideas, these new ideas uh, about what we can start doing about this. And uh, this is the perfect tradition for what's now. And what's now is we, we, we love this forum to be a place to test out new ideas, to get feedback from a lot of smart folks like yourself. And with that, we're actually going to have an awesome night tonight, looking at some new, fresh thinking and uh, getting some really interesting feedback. So what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce here, Tristan is going to come up. He's going to present uh, all this new stuff for the first time. And uh, then I'll come up and we'll interview him a little bit there. But mostly it's about you folks, too. A lot of design tech talent in here. A lot of you folks will be taking your own notes, your own thoughts about how do you contribute to the conversation, ask the right questions, and, and we can build from there. And do remember, this is being live streamed. As always, there's our live stream. There's our hashtag. Uh, you can see this off of the Capgemini site, off the reInvent site as well. And this will uh, live on forever out there. But uh, do tweet about it, tre spread the word, and let's get people talking about this. And with that, let's welcome a big welcome for Tristan Harris. <laughs> That was. Thanks, Peter. All right. Good. Um, thank you so much, Peter, for um, having us here and for proposing that we do this. Uh, we're really excited to talk to you tonight because we're playing with some ideas. This is not like we've got the answer and we're going to tell you about it. This is a really hard problem. <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's on the scale of climate change. We talk about it as the sort of global climate change of culture that's caused by technology. Um, we often sometimes say that uh, unlike climate change, where you have thousands of companies and hundreds of countries that have to change what they're doing, only about 1,000 people in Silicon Valley, if they were to change, might be able to change this. We don't think it's that simple. It actually requires a movement. But I just want to lay out, this is very complicated. My goal for tonight is to have a dialogue with you and to lay out some ideas that represent how we might think about new solutions. Because we can't have 10 people or 20 people or 50 people in offices who know the answer and tell the whole world. We need to have lots of people thinking in a better way about what is the problem and how we can arrive at, at solutions. So. Um, we always start by saying, well, what's the real problem of, of humanity? 
uh, E.O. Wilson, the father of sociobiology, Harvard professor, said the fundamental problem is that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. So we're chimpanzees with nukes. And you if you have unprecedented capacity to enact consequences, you have to have unprecedented wisdom to guide that power. That's the core problem. But what I want to zero you in on is these paleolithic emotions, these ancient baked meat suit evolutionary emotions. When I was a kid, I was a magician. Magic actually teaches you to think in terms of the vulnerabilities of that meat suit, the fact that you're living inside of a meat suit brain mind that has certain limits, certain vulnerabilities, certain weaknesses. And while we were all looking out for the moment here in Silicon Valley when technology crosses the line of human strengths, that's when we think the singularity happens, that's when it takes our jobs, we miss this much earlier point when technology, like a magician, doesn't have to be smarter than you, it just has to know or overwhelm your weaknesses. And what we want to argue is that this diagnosis is the best diagnosis for describing why a number of the most important problems have gone wrong. If you zoom into that, what do we mean specifically? Well, take an example. Cognitive limits. Your brain has plus or, seven plus or minus two short-term uh, memory. And when you overwhelm that, we feel that as information overload. Uh, when you take the dopamine system and you start playing with that and you overwhelm that, you feel that as addictive use. When you play with our weakness for social validation that we can helplessly, we cannot not pay attention when our social validation is on the line by others in terms of likes, et cetera, you get mass narcissism culture. Everyone has to be an influencer. Do I have as many followers as my friend? I have to take that photo down, et cetera. Uh, confirmation bias, that it feels good at a nervous system level to get information that affirms your worldview, and it feels bad to get information that doesn't. That's how you get fake news. And if you hack into our outrage, you get polarization. And if you hack into our trust, the limits of what we know, the basis of whether or not to trust something, you get deep fakes and bots, the sort of checkmate on your nervous system. So this is a very powerful diagnosis that explains why these seemingly separate problems on the right-hand problem, right-hand column, are going wrong, but they're all due to this one diagnosis. Now, if you look even deeper, so what do these issues lead to? Well, information overload leads to shortening of attention span, social isolation, teen depression, suicide, uh, et cetera, post-truth world where you don't know what to believe, you're overwhelmed. The point is that this is a system of harms, an interconnected system. It's not some, oh, we got to whack them all over here, we got to whack the, the addiction problem, we got to whack the fake news problem. These are all connected problems, and we have to see it as a system that we call human downgrading, which is the climate change of culture. Because when we, have a, when we can see it as a system, it's sort of like people being obsessed with the coral reefs or just ocean acidification or just the whales instead of saying, oh my god, there's this bigger system that's causing all of these problems. And this is game over if we don't change it. Because it's degrading our sense making and our choice making at a, at a moment when we need that the most. So, how do we fix it? Well, obviously, we just have to turn off our notifications. <laughs> That'll, that should do it. We just we turn our phones grayscale. That should like solve the whole problem. That would be like being in the burning building that is climate change and saying, "Let's ban straws." <laughs> so, obviously, we need to take seriously. There's a deeper thing that's going on here. We need a systemic solution. And I can't say in front of you tonight that we can just like snap our fingers and I'll go do this one thing and it's all gonna happen. Because the real answer is we have to end attention and surveillance capitalism. The pairing of a business model that says the better I am at manipulating in real time your nervous system by knowing something about you that you don't know about yourself and being in a tight individual loop with you that is the core problem. We can talk about that in the Q&A. There's a lot of ways that, in a long-term sense, we can do that. Regulation, dealing with the inflated sort of um, subprime attention economy, the fact that we're selling fake clicks, fake attention to fake users, bots. For fake reporting, Facebook was found to have inflated in one report 900, by 900% uh, their reporting to advertisers. So there's a lot of ways to do this. Apple can do a lot as well, by the way. But what I want to get into is um, how do we actually, with this audience, we're here in Silicon Valley, we also need to change the paradigm of thinking that we're coming from. 
in how we're addressing these questions. So I just wanted to give you a sense of, first of all, our theory of change and explain how do we go about what we think is the way to change products. The ultimate goal, we want to change how technology is built, right? But how do we do that? We have to create the conditions for that to happen. So that happens through external pressure. This is policymakers, this is governments, this is media, this is um, uh, the public, this is parents, this is teachers, all of that. It's also internal pressure, the Facebook employees letter saying we have to do a better job with advertising. And it's also aspirational pressure, that there's, we're all warm next to this tire fire called human downgrading and it's prof we're profiting, it's the only thing that our economic growth is uh, uh, profiting from, and we need to move to something else, but we don't even know what that looks like. So we need a kind of aspirational pressure, there's somewhere else we can go. And to do that, we need to ask transformative questions. Because the questions that we're asking about, well, how do we just like limit notifications, are, it's, it's good, but we're not asking the transformative question that we would need to deal with the biggest part of the problem. So we obviously can't put the genie back in the bottle. We have the technology, it exists. So what are we gonna do? So we look to systems change theorist Danella Meadows, wrote a very powerful essay called um, Leverage Points uh, to Intervene in a System. And there's these 12 different leverage points, but the deepest leverage points is to actually change the mindset or paradigm from which all the assumptions, all the beliefs, all the design choices, all the understandings of human nature, et cetera, come from. Because you can tax you know, things at the edges, you can change the stocks and flows, you can uh, deal with the system in many different ways. You can change negative feedback loops, positive feedback loops, but the deepest way at scale is to change the way that people are even approaching these questions. So what is the paradigm that actually got us here? How were we thinking that we accidentally, because I don't believe people in Silicon Valley, anyone, wanted this to happen. Um, well, how do we get here? So let's take a look. I think if you went down the street a few blocks to um, General Assembly, you'd see a list kind of like this. So what were we believing? We have to give users what they want. It's a donut. We have to disrupt everything. Technology is neutral. We're just a tool. We're a neutral platform. Who are we to choose what's good for people? We shouldn't be the arbiters of truth. Uh, we should grow at all costs. So grow into Myanmar, grow into India, grow into all the markets, put free basics everywhere, be everywhere. Uh, design to convert to drive user conversions. So get those conversions, get those users clicking, drive that actual outcome. And obsess over the metrics, obsess over the quantity of clicks, obsess over the engagement. Facebook to this day still prioritizes time spent. Um, and capture attention. So first of all, this is new stuff for us. What, is there anything missing from this list that you think? Do you think this is a pretty good list? How many of you would sort of nod your heads feel like this is a pretty decent, decent list? If you walked a few blocks away to General Assembly, you would find them teaching product management courses that would basically be this worldly. This is almost word for word, especially we've worked on this topic for about seven years. This is what we hear from the, the mouths of, of technologists. So if this, um, this essentially represents two different pieces of a sort of things fall out of this. One is a minimization of responsibility, and a second is commodifying human experience. That human experience is a commodity, it's a resource, and we can treat it fun as fungible, and we can just kind of get it to do what we want. And these are the categories of the fundamental flaw we think in the paradigm. So this, running in the mind of a technologist, is what created all of this, right? When you have, give users what they want, disrupt everything, you get information overload, mass narcissism, addictive use, et cetera. So if this isn't the paradigm, this obviously, you know, again, no one intended for this to happen, but this was a way of thinking. So what is the alternative new way to think about these things? So I can't tell you here that we have the perfect list of the new principles that are gonna guide us towards some perfect new utopia. What we can do is ask for these existing beliefs what would not be the update that we would want to make to that, right? So instead of giving people what they want, how about, like a magician, let's understand what people's vulnerabilities are. And seeing, like the matrix, the code that's running on other people that cause them to be vulnerable or do what they do. So what causes them to pick item number one or two on the menu? What causes them to pick that A-B tested, emotionally resonant word in that political ad, right? So seeing the world in terms of human vulnerabilities. The second is instead of disrupting everything, if we find and strengthen the things that we're already brilliant as human beings at doing with each other. We're actually really brilliant at 
uh, uh, finding common ground over dinner conversations. We're really brilliant at building trust face to face. We're really good at building empathy in that sort of face to face. If you take an example of um, uh, cyberbullying, if I say something and bully you face to face as a child, my nervous system automatically has on my balance sheet feel the thing that I cause you to feel when I see your facial expression shift. So we automatically have all the brilliant closed loop type uh, uh, relationships that we've evolved for millions of years to have, but we need to find and strengthen the existing brilliance instead of disrupting everything. We can still enhance it, by the way, with technology. Uh, and then instead of uh, technology's neutral, we realize that we're the urban planners for the social fabric. We are actually organizing the wiring diagram of the flows of human attention, the terms and bases of people's relationships when we make decisions about email, Snapchat, Snapstreaks, uh, messaging, et cetera. Uh, instead of, uh, sorry, instead of who are we to choose, we realize that it's no, there's no such thing as not choosing. When you choose, you, you are making a conscious choice when you're not choosing. Be conscious of what that choice is and be aware of what values you want to promote. Uh, instead of growth at all cost, make sure that growth and scale are always bound to responsibility and accountability. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, instead of designing to convert users' behavior to narrow their experience like a sheep, we design, design to enhance people's own capacity for greater sense-making, more omni-considerate choice-making. And instead of obsessing over metrics, we ask, how can we obsess over the things that really matter in people's lives and at this moment in history? And instead of trying to capture attention, we ask, how would we regenerate people's attention and nurture their own capacity and awareness? So attention is, is really sacred. It's, the, last, it's the, fi the one last finite resource we have, and that's why the attention economy and this finite zero-sum land grab is what got us here. So let's take a look. Uh, at this list, and what's different about this list is the first part is that we're actually embodying responsibility. So from minimizing responsibility to embodying responsibility. And the second part is actually instead of commodifying human experience to enhance the capacities for wisdom. I don't mean this in a fluffy way, I mean this in a genuine way. Like people having a higher awareness from which that is the basis of the way that they make choices. So let's actually imagine a problem. Information overload. Oh my god, we're so overloaded. I could give you 100 stats. Our attention spans now are 40 seconds is the average time before we switch tasks, which is ridiculous. Uh, book reading is on the decline. We all know the sort of issues with this. How could we have ever created a problem like information overload? Well, when you think about this, you can see the ways that if you're giving people what they quote unquote want, the want is in quotes, we assume technology is neutral. Who are we to choose what's good for people? We just drive that growth at all costs. We get that clickbait going. We reinforce the thing in your nervous system. We get the outrage because it works better. Every word of moral outrage you add to a tweet increases its retweet rate by 13%, uh, and we capture attention. This outcome is obviously not by accident. So let's ask, now imagine we're trying to solve that problem from this paradigm. It's very hard to solve this problem from this paradigm. You can't. So let's try to imagine this other paradigm. Now think about, I'm not saying I have the answer to information overload. I'm asking you and the people in the tech industry watching this, when you see information overload as a problem of human vulnerabilities, what are the things that pull us into other experiences, the infinite scroll, the ding, and then something like 70% of people uh, respond or look at a text message within a, two minutes of its arrival? It's, it's just ridiculous. We're so vulnerable to these things. Um, if you're trying to find and strengthen existing human brilliance, what are the ways that we're naturally brilliant at dealing with information and being overloaded? What are the ways that we are naturally more centered, more grounded? How would you design to strengthen, for example, people's uh, breathing or how much time they spent walking before they walk into that information overload type situation? It's not just about providing the better tech answers, it's about asking at a human level, how can we, how can we strengthen that existing brilliance? Um, we're constructing the social world. How are we wiring up people's relationships that they get overloaded? I hope you get a sort of a taste of what this looks like, and if you go back this is kind of funny for me because we were talking as a team about this example. This is an example that came from a TED talk that um, I gave in Brussels in 2014, which was about distraction and imagining that there's this person on the left. Um, sorry, so let's imagine we're thinking about distraction in terms of people's vulnerabilities, strengthening their existing brilliance, and nurturing their own awareness. So that we're thinking in, this, in these terms about the problem of distraction. So we've got these two people. On the left, you have, uh, I think it's Nancy. On the right, you have John, who's, so Nancy's working on a document. On the right, you have John. And then John realizes 
oh, sorry, first Nancy gets to say that she's focused, and then John says, oh shoot, I need to ask Nancy for that document before I forget. And so he opens up a chat window, except now there's this marking of that he's focused. So when he sends the message, we have to make sure we're giving him the capacity to get this off of his mind to regenerate his attention, because otherwise that would loop on his mind if he's sitting there like, oh, I don't want to interrupt her, I see that she's busy, but then I, I have to hold it on my balance sheet. That's going to be expensive. We have to get it off of his, his balance sheet, also not on Nancy's balance sheet, and manage the global flows of attention in a social way, nurturing the awareness of both parties, and hold the messages so that it stays there. Right. So this is hopefully in terms of thinking about how are people vulnerable to that. For example, there's a cognitive bias in our um, brain called false urgency, that when something comes and it dings you, you get this sort of urgency. You, have, you falsely apply urgency to the situation that, that isn't actually there. So this is one example. OK, so let's take a problem like polarization. Well, how would we have ever gotten a problem like polarization? Well, we're giving users what they want. Uh, we're disrupting everything. Who are we to choose what's good for people or what's true? Don't make us the arbiters of truth. Grow at all costs. Design to create conversions, maximize clicks, etc. If you're trying to solve for polarization within this paradigm, it's very, very hard. Right? How, how would you do it? You try to re-rank news feeds a little bit, but you're still, this is the fundamental ideology out of which all of these solutions are fall falling. So if you try to solve polarization a different way and say, OK, let's, let's ask the questions. How are we vulnerable to polarization? Meaning, what are those things that trigger us into a separating, disconnecting, you're not human, you're someone I don't even know how to relate to you, you're totally different, right? Um, how would we see what are those triggers, those vulnerabilities that drive us into that state? Finding it and strengthening, what are the natural peacemaking, what are the natural contexts in which we're really naturally brilliant at seeing across different lines? How are we constructing the social world? For example, am I giving, I could construct a wiring diagram where everybody who uh, feels one way about gun control is exposed day after day after day to everybody who feels maximally on the other side of gun control. That's sort of like the worst case scenario of polarization. How can I differently construct that wiring diagram? Um, and how can I nurture the awareness, for example? There's a lot of things. I'm giving you the tools so that you can think about these questions. And so here's an example where if you take, you know, thinking in terms of vulnerability, strengthening our existing brilliance, and uh, nurturing awareness, Living Room Conversations is an example of an organization that sets up these Zoom chats about topics from across the divide, where small group conversations, not 100 people in a Zoom chat, not a dinner table with 100 people, that doesn't scale to the vulnerabilities, the sort of social dynamics of human brilliance, but six people or five people split evenly across party lines with good facilitation. And this has actually been really great and working. Um, things like letter.wiki. This is an example of an organization that has built. Notice that the, um, the founding fathers, and in many different cases, we used to write these long letters to each other. We used to have correspondence. We used to write these big ideas. So if you debate something like climate change, there's a real complexity to the trade-off between climate change work and economic growth. What's that right trade-off? There's a, there's a more compl complex discussion to have. If you have the discussion on Twitter, how does that go wrong? You could just imagine, right? You get context collapse. Someone takes something said out of context. That creates silencing, chilling effects. Now I don't want to say anything. So you get this whole ecology of things going wrong, whereas this is two people, public intellectuals or people who are kind of engaged in the issue, have a conversation in public with respect, with trust, long form letter writing in the public, but they're not trolled by everybody else in the process. There's ways to design the system differently. Let's take one last topic of learned helplessness. So why would we experience learned helplessness uh, from this paradigm of giving users what they want, disrupt everything, who are we to choose, growth at all costs? Why would we get learned helplessness from, let's say, news feeds? Well, when you're bombarded with news like this every single day, um, it's kind of clear, right? And if you thought about this, we were giving people what they wanted, we were driving conversions, we were capturing attention, and who's to say what's good for people? Because we're just giving people, and this is good, I mean, we want people to certainly have an awareness about climate change, but is this the way that we want reinforced with 2 billion people's nervous systems, 2.7 billion people, when they click on climate change, you keep clicking on it, you get this sort of loop of basically the apocalypse, and your news feed looks like the apocalypse after just a few things, right? So, and when you're living in this paradigm, what else could you do? You could give people different news about climate change, different news clickbait about climate change. But that's not enough, right? So imagine we flip these around, and we say, okay, what if we were asking, you know, how are people vulnerable to learned helplessness? What are the vulnerability points where you feel lack of agency? Because you don't feel like there's any choices you can make. Um, oops, sorry, let me go back. 
Um, and, uh, oops, I keep doing that. I'll do this one more time. Okay, I think I got it. So uh, this is look in terms of vulnerabilities, enable wise choices, meaning what are the, if we heighten people's own sense making and capacity around what are the choices that most matter with climate change, instead of dosing people with learned helplessness and endless articles about the apocalypse, you could be giving people collective actions that they could take with other people and try to create act empowered action, nurturing higher awareness, higher choice making. So um, this is just a set of examples and a set of tools to think about these things. Right? If you think about how much needs to change, the only way to do that is to have everybody in a decentralized way asking deeper questions uh, better questions and having better conversations in their company instead of just we're giving people what they want and there's no conversation to have after that. And why must we change paradigms? Why is this so important and so urgent? Because the complexity of our problems is going up. Our problems are getting more, we're generating with exponential tech increasing problems and our capacity to respond to those problems as human beings, as a civilization, is been, in general, it, it would tap out, right? We're creating problems beyond our response capacity. Um, a friend of, uh, of our community, Zach Stein, says it's when the task demands of civilization exceed the capacities of that civilization to respond to them. This is an existential situation. And the biggest meta problem is that our biggest problems are exceeding our capacity to solve them. The reason why this threat is so urgent and why all of us have to be part of the solution is because Human downgrading takes this and it does that to it. We are making, it's degrading our sense of what is true, of what actions we can take instead of how helpless we should feel, how empowered we feel, whether people can date or they feel lonely and they're swiping, or they're like, right? This entire thing, we have to reverse human downgrading. And we all have to be part of that solution. We have to turn it from a graph that looks like this into a graph that looks like this at a systemic level. So we have to upgrade our, our capacity to respond to this. That means better sense making, better choice making. That doesn't mean better news articles and better news feeds. It means in a deep way, what is good sense making around these problems? How much time is there to uh, deal with the methane bomb and the permafrost? What can we do about, is geoengineering safe or not? These are important questions that there has to be deep, sophisticated conversations about, not lightweight, uh, naive conversations about. Now, while this might seem depressing, and it might seem impossible, I'm gonna tell you why at least we as an organization wake up every day, and why you're here hopefully in the room, and why we have, we have hope. Because when I, as an example, in my own experience of working on these issues, um, in, in 2013, there was a presentation that I made inside of Google that was basically saying, hey guys, I think that we've enabled this channel in which we're enabling people's cognitive biases to be hijacked, and it was called a call to minimize distraction, worried that distraction at a mass level would be sort of this, this big existential problem. And for two years, I was like walk, running around Google and I was trying to get product teams to say like, what can we do about this? Like we gotta do something, we gotta deal with notifications, we have to change the way app incentives work, we have to do all these, these things. And nothing changed for, for just forever, like two and a half years. And if you ask, if you imagine just like stepping into the shoes of, of anyone in a situation like this, you're talking about changing something so big, you would never think that anything could change. People would literally say, this is just crazy, it can't be changed. And I watched how through public awareness and certain phrases getting out there, very carefully crafted memetics, phrases like the attention economy, or time well spent, that was 60 minutes, time well spent entering the, the, the dialogue, discourse, product development rooms, people coming out to speak about these issues. Roger McNamee, who's a, our friend and co-founder of CHT, who wrote the book Zucked, uh, uh, people like Jaron Lanier, who've been an advocate for these issues and trying to fix uh, surveillance capitalism. Zeynep Tufexi, uh, Rene DeResta, who did the Senate Intelligence Report and been a, a very close collaborator. Guillaume Chaslow, a YouTube whistleblower, saying, hey, there's a serious problem here. Chris Hughes, when I last gave this presentation, it was before Chris Hughes, the co-founder of Facebook, said it's time to break up Facebook. If you told me back then that all those things would have, would have happened, I would have never believed you. The amount of change and the rate of change in which things are changing is, is just going up by so much that you know, a year ago, The Verge said the time well spent debate is one. If you don't know, time well spent was the name of our first sort of entree and, and movement into these issues. 
Uh, why did The Verge say that? Because Mark Zuckerberg in January 2018 said that our goal for the company this year is to make sure people spent time, is time well spent. This was more than just greenwashing, even though it did have a massive greenwashing component. There are actually teams inside of Facebook who measured meaningful social interactions. Entire product development teams were asked to actually think differently about these problems. Apple launched screen time features on phones. They just re released it to all of the, uh, the Macs that are out there, so on more than probably a billion and a half devices, some of the audience can confirm. There's now time well spent type features running out there in the world. YouTube, time well spent. The most encouraging news is actually people inside of Facebook standing up and saying, we, this is still our company, this is our company. Free speech and paid speech are not the same thing. And through in more memetics, things like free speech is not the same thing as free reach, one of the memes that we tried to really push and get out there, and then you have Jack Dorsey tweeting in his ban on political ads, the reason that this isn't about free expression, it's about paying for reach. So how much can change? I'm not, this is not like, oh, like we did this. It's not that conversation. This is a how much can change when everyone says, I'm not part of the problem, I'm part of the solution. And we speak in a higher uh, language and frame about what that change looks like. And that's what we're hoping to dialogue with you about, and we want your help. We're actually going to be running, um, uh, this is not like a, we want you to buy our workshop. It's not that at all. Um, we are actually engaging in public, in conversations about specific topics, election integrity, social isolation. Um, we, there's communities of people inside these companies who work dearly on these topics. We want, everyone is a part of the solution. We're trying to help them. We have a podcast called Your Undivided Attention where we're trying to get as many people into this conversation to up-level the broader understanding about these issues. Uh, and that's what we came here to talk to you about because this is sort of the next phase is how can each one of you in this room say, what is my role in this change? Because you might have felt, you might feel right now, like I felt back then, that like, what, how, how can I possibly do anything? I'm just this product manager roaming around Google, or just these people inside these tech companies saying, there seems like there's a problem here, and it seems like it'll never change. But so much is changing now, and that can continue if everybody in this room sort of stands up and asks better questions. So, thanks. Fantastic. Um, can we get a little mic here? Um, folks, oh good, we'll keep this up so folks can know this. Um, we can also move it to the next slide huh? if you want. Yeah, we might want to move just to, that's okay. Does anyone catch that there? Did you guys catch that? No, no, no put, it back. Back. put it back. Put it back. Put it up there for a little bit and then okay. we'll get back to the other one. I'll keep um, this. Can you guys hear me? Are we picking up okay or do we need the mic? Yeah, I'll give it to you. Fantastic uh, presentation. And uh, you're going to hear a pin drop out there, which is always a good sign. Okay. With this crowd, <laughs> we've had a few drinks in our all. Who knows what they're going to do? Um, but it was a sobering talk, too. I mean, like you say, uh, you laid out a lot there. It's a heavy thing. Those curves are not uh, encouraging. But you ended with a lot of pieces that are, were kind of encouraging you. So I'm just kind of wondering, OK, there's some default energy that's already moving, but clearly not enough, right? So I'm just kind of getting a sense of yeah. like, what kind of ramping up do you think it needs to happen? Or how much is, is encouraging, and how much is, you know, do we need to go another you know, few times up on that? Well, we need and how do we start doing that? So, so the, one of the main things is we have this, oftentimes when, it looks, when you look at the media, uh, about this topic. If you ask like, your average person on the street, like, what's wrong with technology? Like, I, I, I would be curious what your answer is. I, I think that people would say, we're kind of pissed at Facebook about stuff. We're not really sure why. We know it's something to do with privacy, something to do with Russia. They're not really good on the elections. I know that. <laughs> but we should probably get that national privacy legislation. And that's kind of the, th there isn't really, I mean, first of all, if you said, what's the biggest problem in technology? Like, let's say we get, our perfect privacy utopia, which is definitely a piece of the puzzle. It's a piece, especially of the surveillance side of this and the voodoo doll thing we can talk about, about people being able to predict people's behavior. If you dealt with the privacy issue and we all step into this new world, we get a perfect privacy protecting world. You're still gonna have shortening of attention spans. You're still gonna have mass downgrading of the social fabric, social isolation, teen depression, et cetera, because you still have the sort of filters, games, et cetera. You still have all of that. So, what we're first trying to do is organize a conversation that focuses attention on the right problem 
And, and, and so we don't get distracted by a million whack-a-moles. What's been great about the press so far is, you know, I have a lot of friends who work in disinformation. Frankly, they're getting very tired because what happens is every two weeks there's new report, 70 countries now found to be influencing different elections around the world. New report, here's Africa, and here's these seven countries in Africa that Russia has been uh, dealing with. This is the Stanford Internet Observatory that just last week uh, announced that. Um, so I'm saying this because there, um, our, our, our sort of first step and goal is to organize the conversation and have congruity and co coherence around what is the problem and what will it take to solve it. And the problem is the pairing of sort of attention and surveillance capitalism as the business model that ex externalizes all these problems. And until we deal with that, um, we're not going to be able to fully deal with all the problems that we're, we're seeing. Okay, so let's, let's just bookmark the surveillance capitalism thing in a minute here. I try but, to avoid using that word because it anchors people's feeling about the harm in the creepy factor about their surveilling me, as opposed to this is what it's doing to culture, this is what it's doing to children, this is what it's doing to elections. I just say that because if you, if you lean too heavily into the surveillance side in a conversation, the dominoes flow out in a different direction than they would if you talk about attention capitalism. Okay, so, so let's just clarify, and by the way, folks, we're going to swing into a conversation with you in a minute here, and there's plenty here that stimulate all of you, but um, I just want to clarify a couple things here. Um, so I also have been around for 25 years in this world, and, and you come out of that world. So I'm just trying to clarify this inside-outside kind of yes. sense, and, and you mentioned earlier, hey, if there's a thousand engineers could, could do you know, a ton of great work here with, you know, without a lot of you know, outside help. So... It's also my feeling that the people in the tech were a lot of the rank and file, you know, workers and even leadership and all kinds of stuff. It, it really doesn't want to be the bad guys in no. this game, and they don't want to keep screwing this thing up. Right. And they're probably willing to do quite a bit internally, even right. to the bottom line, to solve this thing. Is, is that? Could you talk a little bit about what you think of the level of goodwill or openness is? I mean, you mentioned some good examples there, but that could even take it to the next level? Do you feel confident that there's actually a, a, lot of, um, a lot of leverage there inside the industry without breaking them up and also the outside stuff? Well, so I'm, I'm not, I mean, let, let, I mean, in a perfect, there's so many answers to this. The, in the, in <laughs> the legislation, no, no, it's great. In, in the legislation world, it would take years to get to that, to get to something passing, to that actually leading to change within the company. It would take years. We're not gonna pass something tomorrow. So. Given that that's just a reality, even though we need to, like in the, in the future, we could have a, a legislation that just says we are banning the business model of technology that has a predictive model about humans in a real-time loop that basically profits off of changes in your identity, behavior, habits, or beliefs. We could ban that. That could be legislation. But that's not going to happen in the next short-term period of time. We have an election coming up in this country. We have elections coming up all around the world. We tend to focus, it's actually sad for us because we focus on the election in this country, but for all the attention here, there's like 100 developing countries that have even worse problems where no one's putting any attention. We just had uh, Maria Ressa from the Philippines on our, our podcast. I highly recommend you, you all listen to it. So if you ask, what is a change that will happen on the timescales that are as urgent and pressing as where we're at? It's the inside of the companies, which is why for me, it was so exciting to see the Facebook employees write that letter. And if you saw the way that they wrote that letter, um, I, we would not have anticipated that that would, would happen. And then followed by that two days later with Jack Dorsey saying, we are going to ban political advertising, which, by the way, matches the uh, ad policy of Pinterest, Twitch, LinkedIn, uh, I think I'm forgetting one other one, uh, I think Microsoft, uh, in general, bans political advertising. So getting Facebook to mirror that is now only a couple steps away. And the reason why this is so powerful from the internal pressure perspective is economically, it's a lot more expensive to replace a disenchanted employee than it is to keep the one you have. Mm. And if you have 250 of them, who I think there was 250 in the, behind that letter, that's an incredibly powerful sign. Now, the reason the paradigm work is so important is because the thing that's in inhibiting the internal conversation from progressing has been the ossification of the excuses that we're giving people what they want, 
Those white nationalists are just on our platform. We are not choosing that they get reinforced down the YouTube rabbit hole into the sort of land, you know, the invisible underworld of all of that stuff when they are doing that. Uh, not consciously, but the algorithms do that. So the paradigm has, has made sort of a set of defenses that defend, that say, this is okay. We can keep doing the YouTube recommendation thing. We can keep having an algorithmic advertising thing that says anybody who pays us money gets routed without human review to any one of 2.7 billion people with look-alike models that have private information collected on you from sources that you don't know, uh, targeting some psychological heuristic that, you know, uh, everybody knows the story of Cambridge Analytica. So that is the thing that, that we, we have to, to, to change. So it sounds like you have a decent amount of confidence that internally that things could happen fast and, and move internally I mean, as I mean, well as we time. need if some you, external. If you asked me this three weeks ago, I wouldn't have said that answer. Right? So mm -hmm. what's, I mean, things are changing, just to really, this is, we're all in this boat together, right? And I, I think that, mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes we, we talk about this example of, uh, do you remember the film The Day After? Sure. Um, 1982, about nuclear war, what would happen if Russia and US went to nuclear war? That film was so important because it created an omni-lose-lose scenario that, that re-represented that problem. So everyone was in the same boat and we all lose and it's like, not like we can win because at the time, there were military generals saying we think we can win a nuclear war and that would, Reagan was hearing that. And then Reagan watches this film and there's this story famously of him not being able to sleep for a couple of nights and creating this omni-lose-lose sort of representation. I think right now we think, much like climate change, well, we can keep doing the bad thing because those shitty countries, they get screwed and we're, we'll be fine. And right now we have to see that in this situation, if you degrade sense-making, across the board, if people um, stop vaccinating their children and send them to the, to the schools that you send your kids to, even if you don't use social media, that affects you. If other people, you know, if you don't use any of these social platforms, but everybody else does, and they vote based on the confirmation bias loops that they've been stuck in for a five-year cycle of rabbit holing, that affects you. So I think what we have to see is this is an omni-lose-lose situation and re-represent the problem in those terms that we're all saying, okay, we all get it, we all have to do this differently. We're all part of the solution. Because I don't think anybody, like you said, no one wants this to happen. Got you. Let's go to the big picture paradigm shift thing. I mean, you, you were talking about some paradigms in, in design, which we'll get to, I'm sure, from a lot of designers in the audience here. But it's interesting. I'll, I'll, just, I'll tell you one thing I'm working on right now is I'm, I'm doing a story for Wired Magazine, actually, um, which is essentially a positive scenario of the next 30 years. And one of the reasons we're doing this uh, it's actually a, based on a story I did in the 90s in a similar time when people couldn't see how these technologies could evolve in a positive way. They couldn't see, you know, right. w how China could rise, how we could do a bunch of things. And so we just kind of laid out, hey, if things went right, here's how a lot of things could happen. And it was very catalytic for a lot of people at the time to kind of think that through. Right. Anyhow, that story, by the way, went, got us to 2020. And so now we're revisiting it and we're going to take it to 2050. And the idea is people can't see a way to solve these problems. They can't see how to figure out climate change. They can't see how to solve the attention economy issue. And how much work do you think needs to happen um, through all of us, but through all kinds of ways, is to, to kind of be more positive, figure out positive alternatives, figure out different ways to do capitalism, figure out ways we could do this and give people a lot of um, things to hold on to, things to strive for, this, this kind of yeah. aspirational side of what you're saying. A absolutely. I mean. Um there, there is a, a pathway. I mean, like I said, I actually, I don't think I said this clearly. Um, the answer isn't complicated. It's just really politically inconvenient. The answer is simply if we don't have business models that tie these two things together, it's not even a complicated thing. It's just that we all know that we're all built on this economic system that's reliant on it. It's much like climate change, where our economic system is built on our transportation infrastructure. Everything is built on oil. So even though we know we don't want to do it, we have to keep doing it. But we can imagine a timeline, almost like sort of, you know, Drawdown was launched here mm -hmm. at this at this venue, and Drawdown was, uh, yeah, we were here with Paul Hawking. Hawking. That was three years ago or so, but yeah. So we, we kind of think like this is a Drawdown for tech in a way, right? Where we're drawing down or reversing human downgrading. You know, if you don't know Drawdown, it was the top 100. So they map, modeled, and measured. It was a community of like 200, you know, something more than that of people around the world who mapped, modeled, and measured the top 100 solutions to climate change, uh, and they rank them. And uh, there had never been a plan that said how we would even do this. And now that book, as I understand it, is sort of like growing in sales because people get it suddenly now so urgent. This is kind of like a drawdown movement for human downgrading 
and reversing this, this problem. There's a sort of a timeline thing. You know, there's some things you can do right now, right? You could, I mean, I sort of joked about it, you can actually turn off notifications. You can delete social media. If you do that, there's nothing that the companies can do to sort of get you back to using it again. You, you can make that choice, but that's obviously not the broader social situation that, that we need. Um, Apple can make some interesting decisions, almost like a central bank or like a federal reserve of the attention economy, because they're the ones setting the rules and the incentives and the app store payouts and the policies that say this is what you can and can't do. And if there was, now imagine they did that, let's say they said something like, we're just gonna ban Snapchat. That would sound like a really aggressive move for a company like that to make, but once people understand why streaks are so toxic to children, then the political will is there and the consumer public awareness is there that they can make more and more politically, or previously had been outside the Overton window, they can start making those bigger moves. Right now we have to have a bigger um, uh, uh, problem framing than just we have the addiction problem or the fake news problem. So that every single actor, the governments, et cetera, the Apple um, uh, policymakers can, can, make, can make better decisions. I hear you. Um, but so I'm, I mean, it's good to hear. So, so you are spending time in trying to energize new ways forward, big ideas, new paradigms, how we reshape capitalism at that level too? I mean, beyond well, kind of design principles to how do we move these things there, today? There are people, look. I mean, I, I, I'm not putting it all on your plate, but I'm yeah. just saying, because it seems to me there's a lot more work that needs to happen there. Because people are just swimming around trying to think, what, what's the alternative here? There, how do we even do it? How do we begin it? What do we, you know, how does it really work in an economy like so that? There's a community, one of the uh, people from that community is here tonight, um, who work on these kind of post-capitalism deep issues. And there's protective work to give us and buy us the time we need in the situation we're in. There's transitional work to sort of build that transitional infrastructure that lets us bootstrap to something else. And then there's the sort of prototyping of the thing that comes after. This is really complicated work. There's people far smarter than me working on these kinds of things. I think in the tech world, there's actually, again, you know, um, uh, the, the way that Apple makes the iPhone work for two billion people is the central sort of sense-making, choice-making intermediary between us and our world. There could be a lot of changes at that one point, which is why even though the time spent features and the screen time limits are a small step, but imagine that was done in a much more structural way. Um, that would be really powerful. There's some things that could happen there. Um, I'll just name a couple of political things. Um, so I'm, I'm naming policy, then we can talk more about the aspirational side. On the policy front, Senator Mark Warner has a bill, uh, the Honest Ads Act. Uh, we could ban micro-targeting and extend that. Um, that's something we could do. There's a, there's a bill called, I think it's the Dashboard Act or the Access Bill, Dashboard Act, I'm getting this wrong, that allows interoperability between platforms. So one of the problems right now from a monopoly perspective is that you, if you're not happy with Verizon, you can take your existing phone number without getting a new phone number and move it to another provider. But today, if you're not happy with your social network and someone builds a Wikipedia version, nonprofit version of Facebook that's all built on open source stuff and it was actually great and didn't have any of these problems, there's no way to migrate because there isn't that interoperability. So like banks have, um, I forgot what it's called, but you can migrate your bank account with one form and you can do that easily like uh, you can migrate your phone number, like what happened with AOL in the 1990s, the person who's on Warner's staff models it off of what happened with AOL, where they used to have a vertical integration with AOL Instant Messenger. So if you wanted to talk to someone with chat and instant messaging, you had to use AOL. And then part of, as I understand it, during the antitrust situation, they went through this uh, litigation, they opened up, and they made it an open source protocol. So now you can use iChat and other things to interact with it, and that helped loosen the monopoly grip of AOL that they had. That could happen with Facebook. That could happen with Twitter. That could happen there. So that's one other piece. Another piece is, um, uh, I forgot what it's called, it's the Data, Data Labor, no, Data Value Transparency Act. So this is actually an enabling piece of legislation for antitrust work. Maybe this is too much, but I'm happy to go into it if it's <laughs> Well, I think, I think there's we can talk, we can talk about all well, sorts well, of things. Well, finish it up. So, so, but I guess what you're kind of giving us is there's internal stuff we can do in the tech world. There's stuff that's legislation today we can back and get behind. Yeah. And then there is some kind of big picture work, like it's going to take time, but to kind of think of the ultimate alternatives. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a kind of a bunch of ways people can play in these different environments. And now, before I open it up to everybody, I just want to say, how are you feeling now? Are you feeling optimistic about all these kind of things? Or, or, or where, 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 give us, uh, just what's your kind of zeitgeist right now and you and your team? I mean, I, I kind of think of this like it's, um, 
So a after that day after film, when they, went, when they did the, the primetime screening, there was a thing where the entire country tuned in and watched the after conversation. It was between the head of the Department of Defense and Carl Sagan, and they were actually talking in an open public conversation about how grave the situation was and what choice we were gonna make to deal with it. I feel like that's the situation that I, I feel on a daily basis that we're waking up in. I say that in a, in a way where I, I can't tell you how this is gonna go, obviously, or whether hey, things are on the move and we're definitely gonna pass this legislation. We all know if the political situation goes another year in a certain direction, probably nothing's gonna happen. Um, but I, I will say, the thing that gives me hope is how quickly and how unexpected the changes keep coming from the people, especially on the inside. And again, I would have never, if you told me that in like a year, um, the number of people who come out, whistleblown, the co-founder of Facebook, you know, he's been a backer of our work, like I would have never told you that, that Chris Hughes would be, would be against this. I would never told you that the number of people inside these companies that I know who are working hard on these issues and want to do something different, but they also need more political and more pressure from the outside. So there's a lot boiling, and um, that's, that's what has to just keep happening. It has to be more of that. It isn't, it isn't easy. All right, good time to move to folks in the audience here who are uh, in, the world, in the audience, uh, in the field, in the design field. And, and let's start with that woman in the back here. But can, can I see hands of anyone that, you know, if you can keep going. There's, let's start in the back there. Do we have, oh, we have to run Oh, we do have to do this. Oh, it's working now? OK. Okay, um, okay do, do we have a mic runner? Here. No, you don't have to run. We'll, we'll get to you there. Sorry. So we're working on This is working. OK, great. Thanks. And just if you could just introduce yourself to say who you are and if you have any kind of affiliation, and then, and then ask a question or say your comment or what are you going to do? Thanks for the really inspiring talk. And I um, agree with a lot of what you say. The, one of the things that I saw missing in your list is sort of the lie of the free, the, the, uh, uh, the misleading idea that uh, these services that we use are free. And um, thinking about that in sort of the context of an older concept of the tragedy of the commons and here the rape of the commons where there's this public good that's been um, exercised from us um, right. in this way. So could you speak to that in the context of, I heard you say a few times to abandon this broken business model but not, what, are, what is the business model we can use? Yeah, absolutely, it's a great question. Um, so one of the lines we say is, free is the most expensive business model we've ever created um, <laughs> because we basically profit off our own self-destruction. We profit off the degradation of our mental health, our spiritual health, our collective health, our children. It's like, why would you want your stock price of Instagram or Facebook to go up the more kids have depression and, and suicide? Like, this is just absurd. So. Well, what this relates to actually, as you've already said, is um, not properly accounting for the externalities that show up on someone else's balance sheet. Uh, so it's private profit, public harm. The bill that I was mentioning, the Data Value Transparency Act that Senator Warner also proposed, um, deals, with, deals with some of this, which is that um, in monopoly law, and I'm not a monopoly expert, but as I understand it, the, the issue is that we've, we've done it on um, a price basis. So, we know someone is, is using their monopoly power. If they discriminate on prices and they, they create higher prices, they use that to create prices. But what happens when you have a zero price monopoly of a Facebook or a Google? It's zero. It's zero. So what, what can you say about their monopoly power? Well, so one of the things is that essentially what's happened, that we've been getting one price, which is zero, but the value or the revenue to them is going up because the data that they get and the predictions they can make off of that data, that's actually a gap. So in a certain sense, there's a negative price that actually has been raised on us. So they're actually, it's not a zero price. It's actually a higher price. And forcing companies, we used to call this the uh, show me the money or the you are the product act. So imagine that you're, you, a company that has this business model has to tell each cow, cow how much they're worth before they milk it. So you get an email once a month saying, by the way, to Facebook, you are worth this much to me, right? Um, that would actually introduce a cultural tax so that companies who have that business model feel a sense of disgust about the recognition that they're the product, not the customer. That's one solution. Um, and, uh, and then on the what's the business model, there's a very simple business model. It's subscription. It's just, it's not even that complicated. The only problem is that 
the, you can't get the whole world on one network if everyone's paying subscriptions. And in fact, there's this whole other pernicious predatory thing with free basics where if you don't know um, that in the desire for growth at all costs, uh, Facebook very quickly was trying to grow through the developing world and they introduced free basics which meant you could get a cell phone for free and get the internet for free if basically Facebook was your internet. Facebook is the doorway. There is no like, there's a browser, you know, www, it's, it's Facebook. And if you listen to our podcast with Maria Ressa, Maria Ressa in the Philippines, you'll, she was the first uh, Facebook nation, so the Philippines was the first country that has 100% Facebook penetration, 100%. And they spend more time on social media than any other country. I think it's 10 hours a day is the, is the number. Um, because so many people in the Philippines, they, um, they work abroad. And so they have to work in countries like Dubai or whatever, and they have to send money home, and they can't talk to their family. So social media is the basis for their social digital life. And then if you listen to this episode we did with Maria, you'll hear about what the harms of that are and, and how we change that. So that's the issue with subscription is suddenly all those people in the Philippines have to pay for it, and Facebook wouldn't make as much money. But if we ban the free model and we force these companies to use a subscription model, at the very least that makes us the customer and not the product, and that would change a huge chunk of the harms. Isn't in that case, they're, 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 all, they're a utility at that level. If you're 100% penetration of the communication way in a country, it's, is there a kind of utility model that's closer yeah. to what electric utilities are? Or I think so. I'm not an expert on, on the law that comes in that domain, but I think that that is closer to what we're talking about. But you'd still have problems with um, them being in some kind of loop of uh, monetizing changes or shifts in your identity, behavior, beliefs, or habits. From if that's on top, then that's still going to cause the problem. So we, we still have to deal with with that. Okay. Uh, can you see hands of people? We have someone here, but uh, okay, we're good. Go ahead. Hi, I'm John Kao, and um, I'd like to just wonder with you whether um, invoking the frame of all of this as a public health issue might help you create more momentum and get to the tipping point that you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think we're very early to the movie of how this is affecting people's psyches, but I can easily imagine, having uh, delved a bit into the public health uh, world myself, that uh, we're gonna see the emergence of all kinds of new, unexpected, bizarre behavior, psychiatric syndromes, you know, reactions to stress, not to mention all of the degrading of uh, learning that comes about, Correct. Uh, or at least the m malign influence. So, yeah. you know, you have this enormous community of uh, physicians and public health uh, experts, and uh, not, you know, not to mention human potential types who, you know, right now to me you have a very scattered narrative around the toxic effects of what you're talking about. So there's a little study here and a little study there, but there's no overarching that, intellectual framework. Yeah. That's why this diagnosis yeah. is so important because you'll even find, I think it came out like a week ago or something, there's this whole thing about is social media ruining a generation and there's this new article that says, oh, well, it's not because the data shows that it's not doing that. So you can be like, well, I guess it's okay and I guess it depends on the amount of screen time and if it's this much, then it's not this much and what's the clinical definition of addiction? You get into that conversation, it doesn't go anywhere. Just like oil companies would prefer to have you have a conversation with you about What's your footprint? What, what can you do to manage your footprint as opposed to what can we do to change the census system on our side? When technology companies make it about screen time, and that's the currency of the problem, it's a distraction from the issue. So the whole purpose of this is to bring us back to the mechanics that are predictable of human downgrading. You're always going to get shortening attention spans. You're always going to get uh, more extreme views because that's the reinforcement. You're always going to get these things. But I totally take to your point. I think what we should communicate is that human downgrading is a public health, a global public health like epidemic. Um, and it affects, especially on the children's side. The interesting thing about this issue is everybody cares. Obviously, we all care about ourselves, but we care even more about, our, about children. And it's totally bipartisan. And everyone sees it and has a first person experience with it. So we, we actually think that, and our first partner on this was Common Sense Media, um, which is an organization here in San Francisco, does children and tech advocacy. Because I think that's actually going to be the, the fastest lever to get people to care about it. And create a sense of urgency. And create the urgency, yeah. The election, I would say the election and children are the, and the erosion of truth are the, the space of the most urgent representations of the problem. We have a request to go back to the slide with the old Greek paradigm. Is the background, is that okay? Yeah, great. I can do that. Yeah, thanks. You know what that is? Okay, okay the, we got a woman here. I'm, I'm moving my way this way, so I see all these hands. But uh, go ahead. Could we get the next question? 
Hey, Tristan. Um, I just wanted to follow up could, on... Could you just introduce yourself for those oh, that don't know sure. you? Oh, sure. My name is Ariel Sionflin. I'm a design researcher at LinkedIn. Um, I just had a follow-up question on what you said about subscriptions, because it's something that I've thought about specifically as it relates to Netflix, because I think all of us who have been using Netflix for years have kind of watched how Netflix has evolved, and I'm always surprised the things that Netflix is doing to make it really difficult to remember to like turn it off or not watch the next episode. Mm -hmm. Like All of a sudden now, as soon as you log into the app, something's already playing, and I'm like... <laughs> I'm not going to pay you anymore. Like I'm already a subscriber. What are you know? Like w to what end essentially? Yeah. And so, I guess as you said that, it kind of made me think: Is that the solution, or is there somehow like an even deeper problem of our own insecurity about the value of our tools? Like you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's a great yeah. question. I'm really glad you're asking it. Um, Netflix was one of the examples we brought up. Um, I remember back in the earliest days of this work. I'll just tell you one quick story before I answer your question. Um, do you you'll remember when Netflix used to be the DVD in the mail service? Right? There was an interesting example that um, I have to double verify, but I, I did hear from one person who had knowledge of it, that if you looked at a user account and what movies they ordered on DVD, when they became an online user, a digital streaming user, their taste preferences changed. Because in the offline version, you're ordering for your future self, and in the digital version, you're ordering for your present self, which speaks to the, the, the magician's view of the human mind, which is that we have hot states and cold states. We have system one, system two. We have impulsive decisions and reactions. And if you have autoplay and reinforcement and machine learning in there, it's like game over. You're totally checkmate, and you're going to watch and binge for hours. So <clears throat> the, you're 100% right that even if you have subscription models, attention is still the finite commodity, the finite thing that people are going to compete for. So what the... Um, decoupling of attention from um, monetization does is it relaxes the maximizing um, competition among all the actors and hopefully relaxes that competition a little bit. Meaning that, um, you know, I'll, I'll actually tell you because in, in Netflix case, my understanding is they found that if they don't maximize watch time, at some point people sort of cancel out. And instead of defining what that minimum threshold of use is and just trying to get you back up to that, they, um, uh, they still kind of keep going and they maximize forever. If you don't know, the CEO of Netflix said that our biggest competitor is, uh, uh, what is it, we're competing with sleep. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's, and he says that in a board call, in a, in, a, in a glad way, and he said that again, so it's not like a gaffe and he fixed it. It's like, no, they actually still believe their biggest competitor is sleep. So um, this is where I think regulation kind of comes in. And I think when you think about E.O. Wilson saying that the solution for Earth is that you just like mark, I think, was it half Earth? Do people know? Half Earth is just protected natural resources, and we just don't, do, we just, national park, we just quarantine it. And we can do that with the attention economy. And there's various ways that in media we've done that. In Finland, they have like a soccer break that's a public service announcement with a public TV channel does news, public news, public benefit and inform news in the middle of the center of the attention economy, which is the soccer match. There's a whole bunch of ways we can have those kinds of things. Another metaphor for you in that realm is zoning laws. So it's like we have this wild west of an attention economy. We don't even have a distinction between the children's parks and the election area and the public square. We just have this wild west where everyone's just gunning for attention and shooting pistols all day. Um, <laughs> and so we could at least say, hey, look, there's this area called the children's section that we protect differently. There's this area called um, uh, the way politicians reach uh, people which we, we give equal, we could actually reintroduce the fairness doctrine. Facebook could replace the whole political ad thing and say, nope, we're not doing that. We're just going to give fairness, uh, uh, policy-based, long-form videos, answers, to complicated questions. And we give each person the same amount of time, and they could introduce that and have it be an equal playing field as opposed to introducing even more money into politics and creating more uh, you know, game theoretic uh, messiness. The fairness, just, is, you mean the broadcast television um, rule? Uh, sorry, that, yeah, the fairness is, doctrine was, was from television up until, I think, 1980-something or 19... Reagan got, Reagan got rid of it. And um, so we, we had a rule that said we have to give equal airtime to different politicians. Actually, in election advertising, we, we still have a rule that on TV, it should be the same price for Donald Trump and whoever it is to run an ad at 7 p.m. on a Tuesday at this district in Kansas. It has to be the same price. If it's not the same price, it's not democratic. Mm -hmm. And they do regulate that. 
But what happens is when you have technology eating the world and it gobbles up elections, each time it does eat some part of the world, it deintroduces the protections we had in that part of the world. So where we had protections on elections, it takes those off. When it gobbles up children, Saturday morning cartoons, it takes off those protections. So you can think of the amoeba, the Frankenstein, kind of eating up different parts of society, and then whatever protections you had, it replaces with a wild, lawless, wild, wild west situation. So that's an even more powerful framing to sort of create the urgency for we've created this sort of mimetic technological layer sitting on top of society that's unregulated while we have this lawful thing down here, but up there, it's, it's, you can't do anything. Another idea, okay, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Silvio. Thanks for the talk, it's great. Uh, I'm a designer. Um, I would say I will try to design a new humanity. That's the reason why I'm here. And so what I wanna ask you is like, we are speaking so much about system and from a system perspective, I truly believe that we should have an impact on an individual level. And so my question to you is, in the equation, what is the purpose for people and for humans? And um, for example, in my, in my journey, I realized doing mentorship for people in the design world, like in the startups environment, uh, we are missing that piece a lot, understanding what do we want as a humans, mm -hmm. even before being part of a system. And so my question to you is like, first of all, what is the purpose for individuals in your principle and not from a system perspective, but from an individual perspective? And second of all, you spoke about pressure, external pressure. I would speak more about triggers for individuals. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is like, why you are doing it? Is an external pressure, is like an you know, uh, internal pressure, or is like ambition? Uh, that's just to share with a me, machine all of or us. Mission, no, think. it's like your ambition. Yeah. Ambition. Yeah. So why you're doing it? As a motivation especially. for the technology. For yourself. Or you? For me. For yourself. Oh. Yeah. Okay. That's really matters to me. Thank okay, you. Okay. Great. So the first question was on um, uh, values. What, what is the purpose that each individual holds for their own life? Um, so there's this interesting thing. I did this um, talk with Yuval Harari, the author of uh, Sapiens. And this is from him that I, I, I just think this is just the right diagnosis. What we have with technology um, crossing, we call that point when technology hacks human weaknesses. We call that the inversion point. Because what that means is that the center of moral authority in the post-enlightenment era is human thoughts and human feelings. So the customer is always right. The voter knows best. Trust your heart and your feelings. That's, so we put the center, like the Copernican revolution, we put that at the center of our moral universe. Therefore. If you use the product for too long and you're scrolling infinitely, that's your problem because that was your choice. If you click on the white nationalist videos, that was your problem because that was your choice. That must be the thing you value. That's the way we talk about these things in a, in a sort of revealed preference, rational actor kind of theory. Okay. In a world where technology has asymmetric advantage at knowing certain facts about your emotions or feelings better than you know yourself, that can be in a lightweight form where the designer knows that Infinite Scroll, so Aza, who's our co-founder, invented Infinite Scroll. And, you know, it was in a, in a sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, you can watch other talks he's done about his regrets about that. Um, and, um, Could you say, explain that a little more? He, Infinite, he was, Scroll, Infinite Scroll is the, the fact but that. But he, what was your relationship to that? Uh, I inflicted it upon the world. You yeah. inflicted he it gave, upon he the gave, world. So he, the, Right. Frictionlessness is better. Ease of use is better. Easy equals better. Simple equals better. As opposed to I'm atrophying some invisible quality of someone's own agency and choice making in the process of making it easeful, frictionless, and they're losing control. Um, and so we don't have these good distinctions. And so um, the, the reason I brought this Yuval Harari point up is that if you ask, OK, well, so we should really respect the, the individual's own values. But in a world where you've degraded in a, in like a multi-generational way, do, what is the authority of someone's value? Like, let's take um, a teenage Instagram influencer. Their values, they will tell you, uh, for this, let's made up this person, is I want to, because I'm making lots of money, make $10,000 a month putting a makeup channel on, telling other people how they can diet and be skinnier. That's my value. Now, you, technology designer, are just trying to serve that value. 
That sounds like she's the customer, you're the business, so we should just serve that value. But that actually reflects a multi-generational thing where she was infected with the desire to get addicted to attention from other people because of some inadvertent design choices where my friends who invented Instagram created, uh, actually mimicking Twitter, the number of followers, number of likes model. And that number of followers, number of likes model got people, they found that that was actually a, inadvertently, it's effective for getting people to come back every day because now you get to see, do I have more followers than I had yesterday? Do I get some more likes? So now we're all addicted, now we're our own channels. And so now we've created this culture where that's the sovereign value that we're trying to serve is that, that teenager wants to get likes. So should we serve that? Or if we roll the tape back, successful advertising is when I successfully crawl down your brainstem and I have you valuing the things I want you to value. So then what, this is sort of the Yuval Harari, like there's a breakdown of the center of the moral universe. And you have to roll back the tape and say, how many generations back do you want to go? And what does it mean to authentically have a new center of the moral universe that is a, some kind of wiser version of human thoughts and human feelings? Um, there's someone here, Forrest, who, who works on topics like this. And um, so you're asking really deep questions. And then I think the second question was about amb ambition. Yeah, for me, I mean, uh, what motivates you? What, 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 why are you doing this? I, you know, there's, it's funny, because we've uh, been working on these issues for a long time. I've been working on it for, um, since, I mean, when I was at Stanford at the Stanford First Wave of Technology Lab, that was 2007 or so, starting to get concerned about the issues. Um, and we've seen it evolve in so many different ways. When I understood where this was going, and I had a sense, I didn't know exactly, but I just had some sense in 2013 about this is just gonna get worse and worse and worse and worse. Uh, and I didn't know what to do about that. I didn't say, oh, I want to make this my career. Right? I, I actually, when I was in Google, I, I, I thought like, nothing happened for three years. I should just give, I should do something else. I'd prefer to do something else in life. When you see how this is going though, the urgency for the election, for children, for democracy, for how this is affecting every country, like this is the most urgent problem that I know. And for me personally, I care most about climate change and this is the destroying the sense making, integrating the sense making that we need for, for that to come to consensus. So I, I think this is the problem beneath all other problems, and that's why it's so important. Love it, okay. We got so many questions here, but yeah. yeah. Let's go to the next one. Um, Amit Pradhan, Silicon Valley Blockchain Society. This is fantastic, thank you. You know, a lot of this comes down to incentives, right? Because this is a room full of designers, but you know, I think the messaging for investors, because at the end of the day, when you think about who's building this, you know, step away from just Facebook and Google, Right. Yeah. There's a lot of great innovation happening. People are building you know, what the next uh, decentralized social network will look like. At the end of the day, they need capital. The capital is coming in from traditional VCs. The VCs are getting money from traditional LPs. It's all tied to the same cycle. Correct. And you need a Google or a Facebook or a WeChat. Right? We keep talking about just America, but no, there's yeah. a big dominant you know, China, Asia ecosystem. Correct. Are going to end up being the reason investors put money in because there is an exit model built in, right? And so I think to solve for these bigger challenges, we need to look at the ecosystem a little more wider and see how we can change the incentives and, and from that, the buying behavior of not just the people who are designing for this, but the people who are financing this. Yeah, totally. I mean, mm. so long as you have um, VC-like expectations of exits and crazy growth, where the incentive is grow also as fast as possible, you cannot pair business interest with godlike power because business interest is operating short-term and game-theoretic, private self-interested as opposed to operating for the whole and externality uh, internalizing. You can't have that running godlike power. So um, you know, I think things closer to Wikipedia or publicly funded systems. And you know, we have, governments could also fund this stuff. There's ways that we can do it. Um, I actually think, if you ask me, since you're from the block, blockchain community, if there was a huge amount of money raised for a new blockchain-like identity thing that, ever, that was basically run by the public or governed by the public interest, and then they used that money to pay all the publishers to swap out their Facebook Connect button for the new open ID for the people Connect button, that you could transition the identity basis. There's some deeper questions here about identity and trust, which are the two missing pieces of the internet infrastructure that make possible a lot of these problems. But that's, there's, there's some strategies to deal with that, but it's a longer conversation. 
Interesting. By the way, at the end, we're, we're, we have more questions here, but at the end, there'll be time for food, drink, and schmoozing around, and there'll be plenty more talking. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. I'm Warren Linney from the Climate Restoration Circle here in the Bay Area. And so my um, question is, yeah, incentives. What's, what's the incentive to really get these companies to change and the mechanism? And I think that would be scoring everything, every product, every service, every platform based on climate, based on social justice, and have a numerical score that there's no upper limit. So we have a race to the top, and we have a third-party verification of you know both the algorithm and the the uh, the indicators that they've actually reduced emissions they've actually draw down you know some of their um, offset some of their emissions whatever that then that would incentive then would be that they get a lower cost for their advertising so Facebook Google they don't have to get less revenue they just are valuing things differently and allowing the companies that have the higher score to actually get shown more and you know, have a higher, higher score but lower cost of advertising to yeah. that company that has a high score. So I think that would shift things. Yep, There's, um, uh, that's, that's always the strategy in general. The problem is that the speed of the issue is advancing. So the issue in general, like we're, we're approaching this new realm of these threats, which is that it's, we're competing on speed. And the problem creation is, hap is happening faster than problem responding. And so. Um, Back in the early days, the very first work on this in 2013 was about introducing sort of a, a green badge of approval certification like SEAL and doing ratings. We've had these conversations for so many years. If you ask, like, is Facebook causing polarization? Well, last week their algorithm was totally different than this week, and so how do we really know? Should we rate them last week, and then what do we tell? Is that the same in Sri Lanka as it is in you know, the Philippines as it is in Kansas? And so the challenge is the complexity of problem creating is faster than the ability to do rating at that level. So you want to go to the generator function level of is the business model aligned with people fundamentally. And that's the, the easiest way to know whether or not you've got a good rating is whether or not your business model is aligned. But your, your, the strategy has worked really well for ESG ratings for companies and moving shareholders away from the most environmentally polluting companies. The challenge, as someone here, Kenneth, in the audience can tell you with Facebook and the big tech companies, is that so much of our um, of the, all the big public funds and the sovereign wealth funds are actually invested in this infrastructure. So a lot of the growth in the stock market has come from these big tech companies. So if you say, well, they're not really good for this, there's no other social network you can move it to. So there's a, th these are the kind of issues that we're, we're facing. Okay, we got it. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Tristan. Uh, Jeff Medford, founder and CEO of Guides. Uh, Sometime after you first introduced this in April, on a Saturday, my very responsible 11-year-old came and wanted to play Minecraft. And I said, you can after you watch this. Mm. So she did. And then my eight-year-old started crying when he found out that I assigned her to watch this because he didn't get to learn about human downgrading. <laughs> <laughs> That's this, great. This is completely true. That's awesome. And then we talked about what they learned from their perspective, what they heard. Mm. Greta Thornburg has motivated youth mm. to say enough of climate change. What is your organization doing to hit this, you know, my, my kids now so that this Greta Thornburg-like person can emerge and everybody can get in on that action totally. and that wave? Great I love that question. And um, <laughs> uh, you, should, you should talk to, yeah. Um, there's some folks here from CHD. I just want to introduce at least David and Shari to stand up, so if you don't mind. Um, these two folks work on mobilization for CHD and, um, and also working within product, or helping product, comp product teams. And uh, this is exactly what we're trying to figure out. Um, you know, especially around the children issue, I would say that we're, we have not had a good plan or strategy around that, and we would love for that person and that kind of work to emerge. Um, the appetite is obviously more than 100% there, so um, please talk to, yeah, go on. I, I can speak a little bit to that. Can, can you all hear me? Yeah. No. If I just project, okay. So um, I'm in touch with about five or six high school students who run local, like, groups in their high school that are devoted to talking about those issues with a number of teachers who are devoted. There, there are people on the ground who are ready to get activated in the network to work on this. There are some groups like Common Sense Media 
Um, Matt Stotts from our team is doing work that's focused on this area. Um, because we're still a really small team, we're still hiring out, um, we've decided that the highest leverage use of our capacity is to focus on all the people who are coming to us who are inside of tech companies right now who want to be changing the culture and paradigm of how technology is built today. This problem's moving really quickly. We, like, we need to create, the people who want to have this conversation, we need to create a container for that conversation to happen. Um, and so I want to, uh, one way that I would love you all to help with this, do you remember early when it said humanetech.com slash conversation? Mm -hmm. we, we're experimenting with a new way to have those conversations. This is inspired by a lot of the work that Living Conversations is doing. G giving people <laughs> enough to get into a really rich, intimate, vulnerable conversation, facilitated conversation in a small group, um, and then putting them in those groups to have that conversation. The first one of these conversations is happening tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, we're then gonna have a series of them next week. If you all would be interested in joining some of those conversations, giving us feedback on how they're structured, helping to understand how you can um, help to drive this kind of cultural and paradigm shift inside of your organization, please, I'd love you to, to sign up. Could, could, could you get the slides back to that that slip so people can see that, sure. that URL and yeah. um, and have your little have your kids uh, watch this video it's live streamed <laughs> on the, the reinvent site or on the Cap Gemini site. We got a guy here and can I see hands of the last few people that want? want okay, there's so many questions here, but we've got one here, and we'll get a, we'll last couple and we'll, we'll uh, go ahead. Hi. This is Neil Goldberg. I'm a uh, recovering designer and a, a teacher and writer about uh, designing for a better humanity. Um, I love your framework. I think it's, it's really brilliant. It's really what's needed. I think the conversation you're starting is, is excellent. The, an, the analogy with the, the climate change, the global warming movement, I think is very apt. And it raises for me a real concern, um, which is we know what happens from uh, the oil and the coal and the gas industries, what happens when you threaten large, powerful corporations' uh, business models. I wonder if you can maybe just expand on that and speak to how you might be anticipating and preparing for the onslaught. So first of all, I'm not credible. Everything I have to say, screen, there's a, there's, the science is really hard to tell. It's too early to say fear, uncertainty, doubt campaign. No, I'm just kidding. These are all the tactics, as you well know. If you don't know the film Merchants of Doubt, it's actually about how, when there is an issue with a company that has produced some product that is of toxic damage to society, the same playbook of fear, uncertainty, doubt gets played with big oil and tobacco and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, there's security issues, there's personal attacks on credibility, there's, there's a whole bunch of these kinds of things. Um, what gives me hope, genuinely, is that this is unignorable. It is People in Silicon Valley don't let their own children tend to use social media. You don't really need to know anything more than that. It's eating at their own conscience every day that this isn't solved. The, the thing that is the escape valve from that is the excuse, well, it's doing a lot of good. It is doing a lot of good. It can do more good and a thousand times less of the harm if they change their business model. And that excuse is insufficient. As long as the excuse is enough, then they can keep going. So we have to change the sort of rhetorical mimetic landscape. But what gives me a thousand times more hope about this as opposed to climate, even though I wish I could be more hopeful on climate, is that this is a first person human experience issue. This is the omni lose lose scenario. It's the sort of day after thing, except it's today. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I really feel like when people have a clear articulation, everyone will start to wake up and make different choices. And as long as, if you actually come from that place, I, I, think, I think we can get there. We got a last question. Uh, go ahead. Hi, Tristan. It's good to see you again. Uh, you. My name is Cresselia Benford, and the relevant affiliation is Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood. And uh, one of the things that I've been learning um, as I've been working with that organization, parents are coming to us and they're saying that the discussion is usually around social media or entertainment media, but we are hearing about ed tech and a lot of the things on the bad side um, apply to ed tech design. And I'm wondering how your center is dealing with those companies because they seem to be um, 
exempted from this conversation. A lot of people think, even when we do our Screen Free Week, everybody says, well, of course the kids can look at you know, yeah, educational exactly. screens, yeah. but a lot of the times it's not even educational. A lot of the research shows that the ed tech doesn't even work right. uh, in the way that it's touted. So I just would love to hear you speak to that. And I'd like to say I love the new presentation. I love the new framing. It's wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, uh, the, the premise of the principle, it's not up there now, but a find and strengthen existing human brilliance is if you, um, the, there's a lot of existing brilliance that we know of what happens in childhood development, and we could be tapping into that, but because in the same way that, I mean, I'll just do it in a sort of catchy way. Um, in the same way that in industrial capitalism, a whale is worth more dead than alive, and a tree is worth more as, a, as lumber than as a tree, uh, uh, a human being is worth more addicted, narcissistic, disinformed, outraged, and polarized than they are just as a human being. In the same way for ed tech, a child who's just developing on their own in a Montessori school is not nearly as profitable as a child who's addicted to using five education apps that use streaks to keep them streaking on whatever gamified thing happens to be good and then using the money and the profits to reinvest in marketing and propaganda that says this is what works and they won't find out for five years that it didn't work. So um, I think that the, you know, I don't know if I have like a specific answer. I just want to name the sort of system dynamic and um, the other aspect of the, of the education side is no matter what good things, you know, one of our co-founders here, Randy Fernando, worked uh, and started, um, ran Mindful Schools, the nonprofit. It taught mindfulness to children. And he's now working with us because one of the things you find out is you could teach every child in the world, and they had millions of kids learning meditation for like 10 minutes a day. But you take that 10 minutes of good and you compete with six hours of Instagram infinite scrolling. Which, which one matters more? Right, so I think that we have to change the, um, you know, I don't have any good answers on this. I just think that parents and children uh, need to have this conversation about who's really on your team, whose incentives are, are, are in line with yours, and, and how do we actually know that what's, what's genuinely good? And it's a deeper conversation, but yeah. And with that, folks, we are... Should have left with something more optimistic, but... No, 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 I'm just saying, we're at the end of the 90 minute, which is a live stream video, which we encourage anyone to push around, particularly if this is a, the first time presented a lot of this material. It's great to get it out there, get in front of people. Also, you got all these links here to do here. Uh, there are, there's gonna be more food, drink here. All these awesome people he just pointed out, all the people that were actually standing up here. There's so many other questions I saw up there, plenty more to talk about. Uh, and I will just uh, say, so we're, we're going to have to bring this to an end. I will say this is the last one of, uh, of what's now San Francisco in s this year, 2019. But we are dreaming up next year and uh, might have some very interesting things. So uh, we will get back to you on that. But for now, I think we got to give Tristan a really, really big uh, <laughs>